Hello, everyone. Welcome to Art Week. How's it going? Good? Good. Good energy? Yeah. Right. OK. So my name is Ceci. I work at Meta. I lead the creative shop team here uh, covering the Americas. And I'm thrilled to be here today covering one of my favorite topics, which is creativity. So just for you to have an understanding of what we're going to be doing today, today's conversation will center around a study that was made by Meta, CreativeX, and Kantar around AI and machine learning and how sort of this sales analysis gave us this really strong insights around how creativity is helping drive business growth. So we know that creativity is one of the biggest sort of levers out there when we're talking about effectiveness. But we need to understand the how, like how is it driving this growth, right? So we have a bunch of studies that show that more than 50% of the outcome of the auction is attributed to the creative input, right? So the study that we're going to show today talks a lot about how, this how, like what are these creative levers that are allowing us to drive this effectiveness in the sort of campaigns that we're running in our platforms. And sort of this study, we're going to be showing it like later, we're going to be announcing it and publishing so you can deep dive on it. But today we're going to be jumping into these specific creative levers. So an important note before we move forwards, there are two contextual facts that make it really important when we're talking about the mobile device, right? One of them is intimacy and the other one is immediacy. So think about the intimacy of these like, platforms, the phones, right? You, your, kind of your, your whole life is inside this phone, right? And it's not just that, but you have like, you can access this every second of every minute of your day. So it is extremely important to have these two factors into account when you're thinking about this creative approach or strategies that you're putting together, right? So let's focus first on the intimacy. Think about the billboard. The billboard is kind of this public forum, super broad. And then so we transition into TV. And the TV is kind of like a communal forum, right? And then we transition yet again into our phones. And this is an intimate forum, right? And then when we think about immediacy, I was talking about the fact that you can access it like every single second. It's not just that you can access it, but, it, but it's the speed at which you're accessing this, which makes it extremely different from any other medium. Think about the same comparison I was doing with TV. TV, like you did sapping, which was like slow. You clicked there. You had to wait for the ch new channel to come up and then kind of understand what the channel was, that what was happening in that channel. With our phones, we do swiping. And the swiping is way faster. So we need to catch up to this new speed, right? So what we've done to be able to understand this is we've identified tw more than 20 creative levers that can be associated with a better performance, with more uh, efficiencies, right? So things like human presence or eye contact, things like dynamic, the, the sort of a dynamic visual in the ad or nonlinear storytelling are all things that we've analyzed to try to understand, like, how do we make sure that we're leveraging these levers <laughs> to be able to drive the performance and the efficiencies that we need? So, in order to do this, we've analyzed more than 1,200 campaigns. We've, uh, 12,000, sorry, campaigns. We've uh, seen more than 57,000 creatives, more than 13 billion uh, impressions over the past three years to try to get a better understanding of what are these creative levers that are driving performance for us, right? So here they are. These are the highlights of the findings. And our study revealed kind of four top creative levers that are indeed driving this performance. And these we're splitting in like, these are levers that influence effectiveness, but also they are driving this intimacy and this sort of immediacy that we were talking about. So let's start with the first one, like these drivers that are driving uh, intimacy. We know that the human connection is driving like an 81% higher effectiveness. This means just having a single human in the ad or having eye contact in the ad is driving this type of performance. And then the fact that we're integrating brand and product in a seamless way with a goal of like having a higher engagement is driving 46% higher effectiveness. 
But I wanted to sort of double click on sort of the human connection aspect of this. If you think about the behaviors that people have in these online platforms, think about things like uh, lo-fi, for instance, or this new obsession on the behind the scenes. What people are actually trying to do with that is get closer to whoever's creating that piece of asset. They're sort of looking for that human connection. They don't care about the like, perfect shiny object of like a super curated asset. They want to know who's behind the ad, what is going on, how are they creating that asset. They want to understand, like have this access to the low file, low file raw aspect of the asset because they care about this human connection. And that takes us to the immediacy, right? We have like visual dynamism, which talks about like animations in the ads, animated supers or pacing, like what, are the, what do the shot like cuts and changes look like? And then this is driving 74% um, higher effectiveness. This is a really high number. And I wanted to share this like study that I, we used to mention a lot a couple of years ago, which is an MIT study whose goal was to understand like how um, fast can a human process a thought? So they did this study like 40 years ago and they just like ran the study and it took a second for a human to process one thought. And then someone said 10 years later, what if we repeat this study to try to understand if our ability to process information is getting faster and better. And they repeated the study once again and the, the time it took for us humans to process a thought went from one second to half a second. And then they repeated it again 10 years later, and it went to a third of a second, meaning our ability to process information was getting faster and stronger and better, right? And at the end of this MIT study, someone said, what if we use an image to try to understand how much faster does our ability to process information get if what we're looking at is an image? And it went down to like a millisecond of, of a second. But I, I, am, I am sharing this study because when we think about how we put a creative strategy together, we have to understand like how are people relating to these assets, to these creative strategies, right? And if people are, fa are getting faster and faster at processing information, we need to, sorry, we need to have a better understanding of how do we put together these pieces so they are following this sort of visual dynamics that are needed. And this is why this is such an important insight in this study. And the last one is like, kind of related, which is the distinctive atmosphere. So things like what is the color palette or what is the music in the ad? How am I leveraging sort of the semiotic cues to make sure that I'm driving this performance, right? So with this, basically if you think about it, what this study is unearthing strongly is that humans are hardwired to like humanity, right? And the algorithm knows this. They know how it works and they are kind of delivering content against it. But to me, the beauty of this study is that even though it's data led and it relies on machine learning, the biggest thing that came out of this study is the importance of the human element. And to me, that is fascinating. And that's, that is why I am excited to bring on two other people today into the stage who share some of my fascination around this. So please help me welcome to the stage Rebecca Dykema, Senior VP of Partnerships and Creative Transformation for CreativeX, and Tracy Gutting, Senior Director of Creative Solutions Delivery at Canter. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you both. We had to all open, open this now. together because Cheers, it's just guys. loud. So Cheers. there we go. Sorry. Uh, thank you both for joining me today. I'm super excited about this conversation. Um, and as I was mentioning, I am particularly fascinated with this insight around human connection, right? So question to both of you, why do you think that is? Why do you think human connection is so critical when it comes to performance in this platform? Sure. Well, I'll kick it off. Um, I think at the end of the day, we have to remember that humans are very social creatures, right? And so when we use creative elements that tap into these human truths, um, those are the creative campaigns, right, that we see are going to be most successful. Um, and, you know, speaking about the different platforms that Meta was created for, 
it was for connection, right? It was for support, for advice, for recommendations, for entertainment, right? So again, when we see these two pieces come together, that's why we see, you know, that human connection becomes so important. Yeah. No, just to build on that, I loved that human connection rose to the surface of this study. Um, as Ceci mentioned, we looked at 20 different creative elements and essentially uh, ran a correlation between the presence of those creative concepts to uh, performance through Cantar Lift ROI studies. And it was very ironic that in an age of artificial intelligence and in sort of an environment where people are nervous about the importance of people, that what rose to the very top of those um, creative elements was the presence of people within the ad. Um, and I think it, it speaks to a couple of things. I mean, to, to kind of build on what, what you suggested, Tracy, um, there is you know, a reality that uh, intimacy has always been a lever of importance in advertising. Um, those of us who've worked in advertising for a long time, who come from even you know, television would say, creating that sense of connection is important. Um, but the reality is, in a dynamic environment, we've proven with this data that it continues to be the most important lever. And as fast as people is, are scrolling and as important as pacing is, um, that ability to speak to people continues to rise to the surface. Yeah, I, I love that like, being persuaded by another human is still the single like, most valuable thing you can do as a marketer. Like, I, I think it's fascinating. So, where, like, where are you seeing the maximum opportunity to leverage these insights? Like, where does this exist? Yeah, it's a, it, one of the things that was really special about this study was the, the, the breadth and depth of it. As Ceci mentioned, we looked at a huge amount of data, three years worth of advertising content for five different advertisers um, at a global, of, global level of scale. Um, and, uh, and so one of the things that came out of the study was an, an ability to look at which creative levers drove impact. And as you mentioned earlier, 81% uh, better performance for ads, which included people. Um, what the research also helped us understand was the extent to which those creative levers were already being used for the advertisers that we were looking at. And actually, uh, many of you in the room will say, and many traditional marketers would say, well, obviously, presence of people is essential. And yet the reality was, what based on the data that we looked at, which was robust, uh, people were only present in 30% of the ads that we assessed. And so there's a huge opportunity, based on what we've seen, to, for marketers to take this, this concept, which is now proven using data, and go out and actually activate across your system. Do you think, in, in, in part, reels are so sort of successful because they allow for this human connection in like, connecting with each other, with creators, with community? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, again, being social creatures, we're looking for stories, right, and creating stories that are human-centric. We know that stories engage the brain, they invoke emotion, and people tend to remember things um, that make them feel strongly about something, right? And so being able to have something that really resonates with your audience, that really engages them, gets them you know, actively paying attention, um, those are definitely going to be the ads that are you know, going to rise to the top in terms of success. And if you were a creative, like, how would you encourage this human connection? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I think, so the, the couple of things that came out, and it's, it's easy to really hone in on, on inclusion of people because it was such a big and sort of significant um, lever and driver of success, but I think the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, obviously inclusion of people can drive up to 80% better performance, better effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we saw a lot of, um, a lot of impact, and, and I think this continues to show the importance of thinking about people and sort of the product and how they inter in interact and engage, um, the second lever, which we saw in the um, intimacy category, which sort of speaks to that idea of like how you create a connection, was weaving your product into the storyline. So not just sort of having a storyline and like highlighting your product at the end, but like finding interesting and creative ways to weave your, your product into the narrative had a, an outsized impact as well. So I think that's another lever that I would think about if I was a creative when I look at this research and think about how to create connection. And I was thinking of the use of sound like to bridge to that human connection, like you can use human voices, music, like sound effects, like it doesn't necessarily need to be like a person standing there, but like how can I sort of bring this human presence into the ad through all of the different sort of, yeah, like tools that I have to be able to create that, right? And, and Rebecca, I have a question for you. Like when you think about 
the outlook? Like, what do you think the outlook would, will look like in 12 months from today or 24 months from today when it comes to creative? Yeah. Um, you know, I think for us, what's, what's really exciting about this sort of age of, of AI, and obviously it's the, the term that's being used sort of across the, the event, you'll hear it over, no, over through the course of the, of the week. Um, this, this, uh, the robustness of this study was a result of the fact that we used, our, used artificial intelligence to look at so much content at scale. And I think that when you look at the next 12 months, um, the creative data that comes, that, that fueled the study that we ran, will begin to power a total renovation of the way that you can think about um, justifying investment into the creative landscape. Uh, it will um, really reinvigorate, I think, the way in which you start to, the creative teams and the marketers that work with those creative teams can start to think about which creative levers are really driving impact. Um, and at CreativeX, the advertisers that we're working with in this space are thinking really hard um, first of all, about how you sort of lay a foundation um, using technology to start to better understand what, you know, what creative elements are in your content, but also how you start to drive um, effectiveness using that, that technology. Um, and I think, you know, the next 12 to 18 months are going to see a huge amount of change in terms of the way in which the creative conversation starts to have a lot more power in the, in the marketing boardroom and in the boardroom overall. Yeah, I would add to that like some good news, which is like when you think about these large language models that we're tapping into to extract insights, like they're, they're expensive and they're heavy and they need a, a lot of compute power. But as I would love your thoughts, but like as in any type of technology, eventually the costs go down and you have like more and more ability to tap into these insights and not just do it like in a general way, but what works for your advertiser, your brand, your audience, and it keeps on getting better and better. So I think, yes, like the future is bright, yeah. I would say. Yeah, yeah, well, and there are small things you can do today. I think yes. there's a lot of, there's a, there's so much noise around AI, and there's this sense that everyone needs to go out and like tackle it and like, you know, build it into sort of every corner of every piece of your business. Um, the reality is that the, the advertisers that we work with <coughs> oftentimes are thinking about, like the learnings that have come out of this study working with, with Kantar and, and Meta, are actually small, <coughs> very simple changes that you can, you can leverage AI to drive change across your business, but not in radical ways, in ways that are sensible, in ways that are data-driven, and in ways that allow you to build towards more mature a more mature approach over time. So we oftentimes advise our customers to think about how you crawl, walk, and then run in terms of use of creative data for driving um, you know, digital suitability, like sort of what we've talked about here, but also in terms of driving learnings for your own brands as well. And Tracy, you've been at Cantar for a long while. Mm -hmm. Like when you think about the asks from advertisers, like what are these sort of the biggest areas in creativity that they are sort of asking for insights on? What, what do they want to know? Yeah, I would say there are two main areas that we get a lot of questions on. Um, and in no particular order, um, engagement and this idea of attention um, and branding. So diving into the first one, um, you know, Kantar recently partnered with the ARF to do some research on attention earlier this year to understand you know, the two different forms of attention and which creative elements really um, work to get each type of attention. So first there's passive attention, right? And that's basically getting eyeballs on screen, right? Is there scrolling, getting them to stop and look at your content. And this is where those immediacy levers come into play, right? The visual dynamism, the distinctive atmosphere, colors, music, quick scene cuts, pacing, right? Get them to at least just stop and pay attention to your ad. The second piece is active attention, right? And then how you turn that attention into actual engagement so that what your viewer is seeing and hearing in your ad is getting coded to memory. Um, and so that then becomes the intimacy piece, right? The human connection, the story, um, really showing them something that they can emotionally engage with. Um, that's going to resonate with them and then leave them feeling good about your brand, right? And then the second piece is branding. And to Rebecca's point, right, it's, you know, a basic creative principle, right? Make sure that you incorporate your brand. Um, but it's tough because it's not um, a formula, you know? It's not about 
you know, saying the brand, you know, 20 times uh, within the first 10 seconds or about, you know, putting a logo in the upper right hand corner, right? It's about the structure of the ad emphasizing your brand. The brand is the focal point, it is the hero of the ad. When people play back the ad, they can't help but to remember your brand as part of that story, as that narrative. And you know, again, the, the point of advertising, right, is to build positive connections and to build positive emotions that then get transferred at those moments of engagement where the brand is present to the brand itself, right? So that we then choose that brand because it's an easy choice for us to make because we feel good about it. Because that's what humans do. We choose things that make us feel good. And so it's really key then to make sure that your brand is integral to your storyline and is present at those moments of strong engagement. And that, that talks to creative quality, right? And Rebecca, you, like Creative X works with these massive clients. Like, if you had to talk to a creative and explain what the, what creative quality is, like, how would you explain that? Yeah. What, what would you focus on? We were talking about this earlier. Um, creative quality for a creative, for a creative director, is essentially ensuring that your big, amazing, can <laughs> lions winning idea lands on platform properly. Um, we believe there's such, and we've done quite a lot of research at Creative X. Um, like in this instance where we saw that very few ads actually included people, we've looked at um, base levels of creative quality. We've worked with Meta on, the, on evangelizing the Brilliant Basics and helping um, brands track the Brilliant Basics for years now. And we've found that um, typically an advertiser's adherence to basic digital suitability is around 20%. If you're a creative director, that should terrify you. Because that means that your creative idea is landing on platform with the wrong aspect ratio, it's not got sound on, on a sound on environment, it's not got supers, it's not got the basic things that mean that uh, that ad is set up for success. And the world is only going to become more complicated. Uh, with the rise of Gen AI, uh, it means that there will be more content than ever before. Um, the likes of um, Meta and other platforms are asking you for, they're creating more super interesting um, formats which require you and your teams to chop and change a creative idea into you know, more and more um, sizes and shapes and, and types. And so um, the opportunity around creative quality is not to tell creatives what uh, good content looks like or what a good creative idea looks like per se. What it is about is about enabling those big, amazing ideas to land and platform properly. And if that means that um, you know, you're uh, working with your teams to help them ensure that every single time they uh, flight a piece of content, it includes, it's optimized for sound, it includes a person, it includes your brand integrated into the storyline in the right way, um, you know, we feel like that's a huge opportunity. But, and I'm, I'm going off script here, but like, don't you think that these insights can inform the actual big idea and not just the execution of the ideas Abs broken down into pieces? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, and that's where the crawl, walk, run concept begins. When we work with um, a lot of the advertisers, advertisers that we work with, so Nestle is a great example, they've gone from what we call a creative quality score, which is a basic measurement of um, digital suitability from 20% now to 85, between 85 and 90% on average at a global level of scale. What they've done through that process is they've, they've built a huge database of creative data mm -hmm. where now they can look across all of the ads that they've run, let's say for the last, you know, we've been working with them for about four years, and they can start to ask other questions of that creative data. Um, in order to, to your point, um, inform uh, using the, the mass of that to inform bigger picture creative ideas. And what's really powerful about um, that model is that you're starting with um, such, you're not optimizing at a micro sort of campaign level. You're starting with a huge database which then allows you to have these macro level explorations and to, you know, to think bigger and more interesting creative thoughts. And this, like, specifically these really big brands uh, have been building their brand for years, right? So, Tracy, I would want your take on, like, brand building long term. This study proved that, like, these creative levers are also driving effectiveness mm -hmm. long term. Like, do you think this is something that's happening more often in these online platforms? Yes, absolutely. So the role of digital has really changed dramatically, right, over the years. And... In North America, research suggests that roughly 75% of total media budgets are going towards digital content. And so 
that means that the rules, which we used to apply, right, when it was more of a supporting medium, when it was more focused on lower funnel um, goals, right, that needs to be totally rethought. And um, digital, as a result, now really has to carry a lot more of the load when it comes to brand building. So we've had to reevaluate and redesign the principles which, which, um, with which we have our um, creative guidelines. And I think the other really important thing to remember, and this kind of you know, touches on some of the things that Rebecca was talking about, of having you know, a number of different assets, is that digital is no longer the you know, just channel that we once thought that it was, but rather it's an ecosystem of channels with different platforms, different um, formats, different styles. And so that just presents you know, new challenges, but then new opportunities right, for advertisers to um, create um, content that also works to build longer term brand equity. And then I've been dying to ask, I know you've been working <laughs> a lot in the field of neuroscience, and I was wondering, like, and I mentioned this MIT study, I was wondering, from the sort of output of this research, do you see any sort of overlap between the, the studies that you've been like working on from neuroscience and what we've seen here? Yes, um, absolutely. There's a lot of overlap. So at Kantar, we use facial coding and we use eye tracking to measure emotion in creative content. And over the years, we've built up a very robust database across categories, across dozens of countries, and the database findings really support right what it is we found in this study with regards to intimacy and um, and immediacy so first and foremost right we talk about the power of human connection and the presence of you know a person a face in, in an ad and that is so effective because human brains are hardwired to process a human face very very quickly within a matter of milliseconds and so when you think about how that plays with creative if you have a face and you have text a human brain is always going to process a face first, right? Is it smiling? Is it happy? Is it angry? Um, and so the other thing to think about with your faces that you show, the more expressive your face, a smiling face especially, really works harder to engage the brain. And smiling is important because that then gets into priming, right? And when we prime our viewers with the right word or the right text, that can subconsciously help to drive behavior. Um, another piece is branding, right? And integrating the brand, thinking of different ways to make the brand integral to your story, including product demonstrations, for example, right? So when we see um, a product demonstration, it gets our mirror neurons in our brains firing. And it wants to simulate what it is it's seeing on screen in your brain. So you think about you know, when you're in an elevator or you're in you know, a waiting room and somebody takes their phone out. You want to do the same thing because your brain is literally telling you, hey, I want to mimic what it is I'm seeing. Um, and then the third one, um, going back to the idea of storytelling, right, and just the power of stories to evoke emotion. And when you think about what a story is in its simplest form, it is the connection between cause and effect. And that is exactly how human brains think. We think in narratives all day long. When you hear a story, you know, you want to then connect it to some sort of existing experience um, that you have. That's actually one of the reasons why metaphors work so well. There was a, a really neat study done by Princeton University where they had two people um, and they measured their brain activity. One person told an, an engaging story and one person was listening. And what they found was that the same areas of the brain lit up despite the fact that one person was producing language and one person was comprehending it. So again, just going back to the power of storytelling, we know that they're um, more likely to cut through, they're more likely, likely to be um, memorable, and then of course more likely than to drive sales, right? So from a neuro perspective, you cannot underestimate the power of a good story. Perfect. Okay, so I leave you with a final question. What do you feel are some common pitfalls uh, that marketers should avoid or shifts they should sort of approach uh, having all of this information available to them? So I think first and foremost, um, you know, obviously you guys are going to agree with me, creative matters, right? Getting creative right matters. It is the single biggest driver when it comes to campaign effectiveness. So making sure that you have a, you know, future oriented strategy where you build in appropriate time, appropriate budget um, to test 
and um, you know we can diversify our um, advertising, we can experiment with our advertising because we do have AI tools available to test them very quickly and very cost effectively. Um, in terms of pitfalls, I would say with regards to storytelling, there's two. I would say don't get so caught up in a story that you forget your brand. Mm. You know, you think about Super Bowl ads, right? And they're so, Amen. yeah, Thanks. preach, preach. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Super Bowl ads, right? They're always big on celebrities and entertainment and humor. And the brand is sometimes left as an afterthought, right? So do not forget your brand as part of that story. Um, and then the second one I would say is just don't take too long to get to, um, to your story. Use the visual dynamism, use the distinctive atmosphere cues, right, and levers to get people to engage and then hook them with your story. Um, you know, there's evidence that a story can be told in um, less time than you think. So make sure you get to your story, especially in a digital um, environment. Yeah. I guess my, my build on that would be um, great creative doesn't happen once. Uh, it doesn't happen by accident. Um, you've, I've heard in other sessions already today, and I'm sure you'll hear this week, you can't uh, manage what you can't measure. And so we really suggest that you think about creative excellence in a systematic way. Um, advertisers who are going to get ahead in the next 12 to 18 months are going to be thinking in terms of how to systematically deploy, deploy creative data to make it a competitive advantage. Uh, that doesn't happen one time, that happens at a systemic level across your business. And um, so this type of guidance is the, the beginning of the opportunity to start to have that type of conversation. Okay. Thank you both so much for this insightful conversation. I really enjoyed the discussion. And I'm hoping every one of you is taking something back that you can like put into action moving forward when it comes to your creative strategies. With that, Thank you all again and enjoy Advent.